Hello, and welcome back to Beyond Networks, the evolution of living systems. Today, we're finally going to move back to biology from our excursion into perspectivism and process philosophy. But before we do that, let me just quickly recap. It's been quite a dense and loaded module so far. In lecture one, we refocused our attention away from what we know to what we don't know, from facts to questions, which are extremely important um, for, for scientific inquiry. In lecture two, we asked why it is so hard to think about processes. It's ingrained that we think about the world in terms of things. And we took a very short tour of the history of process philosophy and introduced a few tools for identifying and classifying processes. In lecture three, we looked at the process of scientific inquiry itself. And the main point I wanted to get across there, it's quite complicated, but it's really, really cool, is that our scientific theories evolve quite like other complex adaptive systems, like organisms or technological systems in the way that they adapt uh, to reality, just like an organism adapts to its environment. And that they also share some features with organisms and other adaptive systems, complex adaptive systems. For example, their modularity or near decomposability, some interactions, um, some um, heuristics, you know, connections are more important than others. And uh, that they have this sort of generative entrenchment. Some theories become the foundation of others and become much harder to change over time. And we finished that lecture by saying that progress in science requires different strategies at different times, depending on whether you're in a phase of normal science, uh, when you exploit an existing paradigm, or revolutionary science, when you explore new perspectives. And I think we are at one of these points where the existing paradigms have exhausted themselves a little bit, and it's time to explore and try new perspectives. So in this spirit, we'll move on and look at biology. Um, taking various process perspectives and explore those in a speculative, playful manner. So let's get started. I want to start this lecture by reminding you how the majority of Western philosophy and therefore also the foundation of, of science is based on a substance-based view of the universe. So the main question in this sort of view is what is the, the world made of? You try to decompose the world and then what, uh, uh, to identify what the components are of that. that. And then uh, what these components do is sort of an epiphenomenon, something secondary or derived that depends on the properties of the things. This view has been the mainstream view of uh, philosophers in the Western world since before, um, uh, Socrates, the pre-Socratic uh, philosophers, just uh, like Parmenides, Democritus, or Leucippus, the atomists, um, were, were focusing on this sort of question. What is the world made of? In the case of Democritus and Leucippus, of course, uh, it was made of uh, atoms that sort of bump into each other and cause the phenomena that we see. And so this is sort of manifested by this uh, mechanistic worldview that modern science has uh, uh, adopted that goes back to, to Rene Descartes that sees the universe as a sort of an in, in intricate uh, mechanism. And if we take the components of this mechanism apart, we will understand how the world works. So th this sort of metaphors based on machines and mechanisms are very, very prevalent. And I'm going to use the work of, of contemporary philosopher Dan Nicholson, who is at the Conrad Lawrence Institute here in Klosterneuburg at the moment. Um, I'm going to lean a lot on his work uh, in this era, uh, area. And I'm going to um, quote a, a contribution he's made to an um, absolutely fantastic book called Everything Flows. Um, I'm going to share a link where you can get it for free. Uh, it's about processual approaches to biology. And Dan says, but out of the endless array of metaphors used in science, it is difficult to think of one that has been more dominant and has exerted a greater influence than the machine metaphor. 
which provided the basic theoretical foundation for mechanicist natural philosophy in both physics and biology. And if you look at the history of science, you know, this, this idea originally came from, from physics, but ironically, physics has moved on while biology is firmly stuck in it. So let's look at that in a second. But first of all, let's sort of think, what, what is the, the, the consequence of this sort of world we won? is that we view the world as deterministic in some way. They're, they're strong and weak forms of this. Uh, the strong form is Laplacian, you know, the demon that, that sort of knows where all the parts are and, and how to interact and then can predict the entire future and the past of the universe. A weaker form is just to say that every effect must have a cause in some way, which is something that we can probably subscribe to. The other aspect of this mechanistic worldview is, is reductionism, right? So that, um, uh, we approach the world basically uh, by taking it apart. If we want to understand the system, we take it apart, we try to find its parts, just like a clockwork, the gears inside. And if we know how those gears interact, then we know how the system works. So, as I said, in physics, about 100 years ago, physics moved away from this sort of atomistic view, you know, where you have small things that bang into each other. There's a great book by James Ladyman and Don Ross, which is called Everything Must Go. And they look at uh, physics in, in particular and sort of the basic fundamental um, reality of, of, of particle physics and all that. And, and they say, okay, um, since relativity, since quantum physics has come, uh, physics has switched from this idea that there's, there's atoms that bump into each other and create all the phenomena to a view that's much more based on sort of fields here we have. Uh, uh, the Enterprise, or is it Voyager? I don't know. Um, in some sort of warp field, um, waves, you know, and forces to mix the sci-fi metaphors a bit here. So, so physics is sort of thinking in a much more system, systems level way. Uh, fields are, you know, uh, what arrange, so the spatial temporal arrangement of forces that cause uh, the components of a system to sort of organize in a sort of a global way. So think of a magnetic field, they're, they're little uh, iron shavings and they, they all align in a certain way. So there's sort of a global patterning generator there. And we rarely think about uh, such uh, mechanisms or such, such uh, large scale phenomena in biology. So ironically, while the mechanistic worldview came originally from, from physics, it is much more prevalent in biology today. And this is a little funny. But I mean, it, so the idea that biology is purely mechanistic starts right with Rene Descartes as well. So he writes in two different books um, about the organism. And so one of the quotes here is the human body, that's about us, is indistinguishable from a perfectly designed autonom automaton. Even we, our bodies at least, because of course he believed that the mind is in a different sort of realm, um, are purely sort of clockwork. Uh, mechanisms. Later he writes, description of this automaton amounts to an explanation of the organism. So for him, all living systems were purely mechanical systems. And we've uh, already encountered the sort of perfect um, manifestation of this metaphor of the machine in De La Métrie uh, and his L'homme machine, where he writes, uh, an organism is basically just a self-winding clock. Of course, there's a lot resting on this uh, sort of self-winding aspect of the system. And he never tells us exactly how that is supposed to work. And so this machine metaphor, not just for the, the world in general, for the movement of the planets, but also for uh, <clears throat> the workings, the inner workings of living beings has stayed with us, although it has mutated over time, depending on the most popular technologies of the day. So in, in the late 18th and early 19th century, uh, the metaphor um, uh, du jour was uh, the steam engine, no longer the, the self-winding clock. Later on, uh, human bodies became chemical factories in the early 20th century. And nowadays, of course, we prefer metaphors to come from computer technology. So it's always the sort of the latest, most fashionable technology that provides the metaphors. Uh, and it's evolving in parallel uh, with the technology. So 
what happened at the same time at the conceptual level is sort of stated here by evolutionary biologist Richard Lewontin, um, who says the ur metaphor of all modern science, the machine model that we owe to Descartes has ceased to be a metaphor and has become the unquestioned reality. Organisms are no longer like machines, they are machines now. Okay, so we've forgotten, and this is the danger with metaphors, we've forgotten that we have adopted uh, a term, terms from, or, or uh, analogies from, from our technology to talk about natural systems. And so this leads to, to a bunch of very predominant sort of uh, paradigms that are, are no longer um, valid. So we'll talk about those for the rest of the course. Let me just quickly introduce them right here. So one of the, the uh, phenomena that I'll um, criticize here is, is the idea that uh, evolution leads to organisms with, that are somehow designed, optimized by evolution, by selection. Yeah, okay. So uh, this idea that uh, evolution is an optimizing process comes, of course, from uh, uh, computer science and engineering where you optimize the performance of machines and we've, as I started saying in the, uh, in the, in the introductory lectures, also optimizing our schedules, our time, our performance. Um, and the other sort of aspect of that is, is the idea of, of genetic information and the genetic program in the genome that sort of uh, runs and, and creates the phenotype as it goes along. Um, these are machine-based you know, computer-based metaphors. Also very famous, of course, uh, is uh, the idea that the cell is some sort of factory that's based on molecular machines. Uh, this idea of a molecular machine uh, goes back as far as I know to Sidney Brenner. And uh, so he thought about protein and protein complexes, little, little machines that work in a factory assembly line built a cell. And this has been taken uh, to its culmination in the, in the BioBricks Synthetic Biology Project, where uh, the idea is that you create a uh, sort of collection of plasmids that encode different circuit elements. And just like you can build an electronic circuit from, from uh, basic elements, you could build uh, regulatory circuits in synthetic regulatory circuits in cell, cells by uh, putting together these different plasmids that, that form the basic elements of those circuits. This project is spectacularly failing right now. Uh, in, the, in very few cases is it true that the, the, these elements are put together and they do what they're supposed to do. We'll talk about why that is uh, later on in the course. And so here we're clearly um, sort of hitting uh, a wall, uh, hitting the limitations of this, this engineering metaphor of the machine. And so um, I'm going to quote a physicist, David Bohm, um, uh, with a diagnosis of what's going on in biology. And he says, and why it's so strange, right? He says, modern molecular biologists, okay, he's writing this in the 70s, but things haven't changed very much. Modern molecular biologists generally believe that the whole of life and mind can ultimately be understood in more or less mechanical terms. Thus, we arrive at the very odd result that in the study of life and mind, which are just the fields in which formative cause acting in undivided and unbroken flowing movement is most evident to experience and observation. There is now the strongest belief in the fragmentary animistic approach to reality, in biology, no longer in physics. And he thinks, as a physicist, he thinks that's weird. Let's contemplate this again for a second. So the study of life and mind, just the fields in which formative cause, we'll talk about what a formative cause is, acting in undivided and unbroken flowing movement, this is beautiful, is most evident to experience an observation. We can see it with our own eyes. That's how living systems are different from mechanical ones. And especially, it's weird that exactly in this area of investigation, we have such a strong belief in the fragmentary atomistic approach to reality. There is a disconnect between what we see in biology and how we go about studying it. And um, I've chosen a physicist uh, uh, to tell you that, but of course, there's also a lot of biologists who have noticed this. So basically, um, this whole mechanistic view of the world comes 
from substance-based philosophy that underlies Western science and Western philosophy. Uh, and the main problem this creates in biology is that you, you have explanations in terms of things, and then you need to attribute agency to those things. So those, you know, let's talk about elementary particles and physics or genes as determinants of heredity, form, physiology, and behavior in biology. The genes have to do stuff. And it's sort of, uh, the, the main problem here lies in, in explaining how they do it. In the 1990s, there was a headline, late 1990s, Dean Hamer, I think, and other people who were involved, uh, who found a, uh, alleles of a gene that were associated um, with being gay, so enriched in the gay population. And uh, there were headlines saying, we found the gay gene. Here, there's a gene that makes you gay. It's absurd. Okay, these were, uh, I think Hamer was, was himself gay. So the idea was that if you would have a, a, a genetic explanation for being gay, there would be less pressure in sort of trying to explain that it's a natural thing. That's fair enough. But how, what do you mean by saying that the gene makes you gay? Okay, so there is no uh, connection, causal connection between the two things. The gene produces a protein, that's it. And that's uh, all it does. And so there is a huge gap in trying to explain how a gene is supposed to act to make you behave in a different way, of course. And uh, I'm drawing, uh, this is oversimplified, of course, we, we are much more sophisticated nowadays, but the, the problem has sort of remained the same. So we nowadays, we no longer have single genes uh, that cause complex phenotypes, but we have gene regulatory networks. So this is an example, beautiful work by Eric Davidson and uh, uh, his collaborators over 30 years, uh, 40 years of, of, of very hard work they have pieced together a network of those genes that are involved in the determination of the endomesoderm in early sea urchin development. And what you can see here is a diagram. So the names in this diagram are different genes and the arrows show you how these uh, genes are connected in different tissues at different times indicated by colored um, sort of boxes in the background. Massively complicated, a lot of work, very, very much detail. Everything has been decomposition, this is the mechanism that, that creates um, pattern in this embryo. But the problem is it doesn't really explain how the pattern is formed because it's just a diagram. It's a summary diagram of a lot of work. But the problem here is it doesn't tell you what this system does, right? So in a way, it still has this explanatory gap. It's a thing. It's a static diagram. And we need to know how we get from this thing to its behavior, and that's the big challenge. In a way, this is not an explanation. It's a challenge. This is wonderful work, but it doesn't explain how the sea urchin grows. It is sort of an, a, a challenge for us to, to, to sit down and figure out what this system actually does, but it doesn't do this by itself. So if we take a process perspective on biology, we want to know how things work, what they do, this is a problem because a lot of systems biology is not really systems biology. It's the, the type of systems biology where you go to a meeting, you have a bunch of you know, shapes connected by lines thrown at you and everybody is really impressed, mainly because you know, it's com what, what the, these diagrams show you, A, it's complicated. B, this person has done a lot of work in their lab. Fantastic, and we're all impressed. But we shouldn't be, we should be asking, so how do we get from those diagrams the actual behavior. I think there's two problems. One I've already mentioned, the diagram doesn't tell you what the system actually does. And the other one is that these diagrams are not just summary of work, they're also idealizations that sort of uh, distort and also uh, ignore a lot of what's going on underneath. And we'll come back to that, uh, of course, during the course. So how can we move beyond uh, this sort of sy systems biology of the networks? Uh, and also by moving beyond networks. Networks are an engineering metaphor uh, based on the machine view of the world. Uh, how can we move uh, towards a more organic processual view of biology? So several people have tried. There's a long tradition. Aristotle himself was very much influenced uh, by biology. It wasn't called biology at the time, but he was very much interested uh, in animals and uh, their natural history. But I think, it, so the main uh, sort of uh, philosophy modern, in modern times here 
that connects to biology is probably uh, Alfred North Whitehead's philosophy of the organism. He builds on earlier work by uh, Henri Bergson and other people, uh, but basically what he's saying, what he's trying to say with this is that in a way biology is more important than physics because he denies that there's a distinction between organic and inorganic matter. He goes very far in this, so he become, becomes a pan psychist where he believes that even simple matter is in some way sentient. We don't have to follow down that path, but the other remarks that he's making are very interesting. He says, biology in a lot of ways is more fundamental than physics because physics is just looking at those aspects of the natural world that are not uh, organic. You know, they're not influenced by this fact that, that matter, uh, there's no distinction between matter uh, that is organic and inorganic. And, and he sort of says, physics is just explaining that part of the world which is not alive. Um, which is less than uh, uh, the world uh, uh, in total, which is living and non-living things. So uh, also he has this sort of uh, idea that through perceiving you become part of the world, you're being in the world and you experience causality directly. So he moves away very much from uh, earlier arguments uh, where, uh, uh, or, or contemporary arguments in philosophy where people were focusing on how we represent the world by uh, language. He says, this is not the case. There's a much more direct way of perceiving the world, just like Michael Polanyi will later say, that you build up a sort of a tacit understanding and awareness of your circumstances. And so in a way, you are uh, in the world, you are part of the world and emerging, your insights are emerging directly from the world. And there is no sort of disconnect between the world uh, in itself, ansich, and your representation. So very interesting uh, sort of aspects. I highly recommend you read Science in the Modern World if you're interested in this. We will not have time to go much into his um, <clears throat> ideas, but, but so Whitehead is at the beginning of a long tradition of process philosophy moving into biology. And uh, this tradition is carried on by, by one of his uh, students, uh, Suzanne Langer, who is mainly famous as a philosopher of art, but she in the uh, 1950s and 60s also developed uh, what she calls uh, a process-oriented philosophy of biology, which is very interesting. Uh, and she says, living systems are composed of acts, and by acts she means temporally drawn out living processes. She said it doesn't make sense to organize, to, to analyze organisms in terms of what they are made of, their composition, but the acts that constitute them, these processes that work together. An organism is built up by its own acts, she says. Remember, these are uh, processes. And these processes should be examined uh, in terms of their temporal structure. We're going to go a lot into what that means, what a temporal structure is in later lectures. OK, so these are the beginnings of philosophers moving into biology. But here we're going to focus on the work on, of biologists who took an explicitly process uh, based uh, perspective. And uh, one of the important uh, people, uh, of course, uh, at the beginning of that tradition is Conrad Hal Waddington, who in 1957 wrote uh, his fabulous and famous book, Strategy of the Genes, still as um, accurate and important as it was ever. And uh, he uh, introduced and, and promoted, mainly in that book, of course, his metaphor his, his image of the uh, epigenetic landscape that you can see here in an unusual artistic depiction. So I want to show you that it's actually moving during development and evolution. It's constantly changing its shape. Um, his work, uh, Waddington's work was later formal, formalized by uh, French mathematician René Thom, um, who uh, invented a whole branch of mathematics called uh, catastrophe theory to formalize the, the ideas that Waddington had in his landscape metaphor. And that work in turn inspired Salvador Dali, who uh, here, this is his last painting that he ever painted. It's called The Swallow's Tale, and he depicts one of Tome's mathematical structures in this painting. So this is a formal science of processes in biology, and we'll, we'll introduce this and we'll talk about it in a little bit and see what we can still get out of this today. Or take the work of Stuart Kaufman, who in the late uh, 60s starts to model um, uh, the dynamics of gene regulatory network and uh, also their evolutionary dynamics, how uh, 
order emerges from uh, random behavior in those networks. Beautiful work that we'll talk about. Uh, and uh, most dear to me, uh, the tradition of process structuralism in biology. Uh, Waddington students, Brian Goodwin um, was the most prominent figure in this movement. Um, he was my master supervisor, but also other people uh, who would not directly identify themselves as process structuralists, like George Oster and Para Alberg, who worked in the tradition of Evo Devo, uh, took a very similar approach to study uh, the evolution of developmental processes, very much based explicitly on the fact that we're dealing with processes. So we're gonna go into the work of those people and many, uh, many, many more that followed them uh, over the course of this lecture series. Uh, but before we can get to the sort of nitty gritty practicalities, we need to ask ourselves a very fundamental question. I've been throwing this term system around a lot and it's sort of at the basis of systems biology. What is a system? We'll ask ourselves this question in the next module and also how you can understand systems uh, with the tools of using mathematical models. This will be the topic of the next module. I hope uh, you'll tune in again uh, next week when we talk uh, about systems and models. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye-bye. <laughs>